Success Story, an on-the-spot live telecast from selected locations in the San Francisco Bay Area, is brought to you each week as a public service by Richfield, makers of Rich Lube HD motor oil and Richfield gasoline. For every machine in every type of industry, there is a scientific Richfield lubricant. Tonight, our cameras are located throughout one of the most exciting and astonishing industrial plants it's ever been our pleasure to visit, the Hall Scott Motor Division of the ACF Brill Motors Company in Berkeley, California. It is within these great shops that the internationally famous Hall Scott Motors of various sizes and types are made with the utmost machine skill and precision hand crafting. Motors of tremendous horsepower for giant trucks, buses, marine propulsion, and heavy-duty internal combustion stationary motors that are the workhorses of the petroleum industry for drilling, great mining and construction projects of every description. And there's a proud history to this name, Hall Scott, a history that looks back over automotive progress to the year 1908, when Colonel E.J. Hall built the world's first V8 overhead valve engine. Out of this came the famous Hall Scott Comet engine, later acquired by the Cadillac Company as a basis for its first V8 Cadillac engine. Millions will still remember America's celebrated Liberty-type airplane engine, produced by Hall Scott during World War I, used in the famous Curtis Jenny or J-1 airplane, one of which was flown by America's beloved Jimmy Doolittle. In World War II, Hall Scott Motors powered a tremendous variety of service equipment from giant tank salvage units and trucks to the fast and daring PT boats powered by the great Hall Scott Defender engine. These are the powerful and beautiful motors which after a hundred thousand miles of service are usually just broken in, which frequently give a million miles of service before any major replacements are necessary that we watch being built tonight. It is a fact that a Hall Scott motor will occasionally be brought back to these shops for adjustment after 30 years of service. And a young machinist will find himself embarrassed by unfamiliarity with the early design of the motor that is older than he himself. Now to take us through the first details of how these Hall Scott motors are fabricated, we turn to our reporter Bob Day and Mr. Z.P. Lloyd, Hall Scott General Superintendent. Mr. Lloyd, I understand that our real point of pride with everyone associated with Hall Scott here is the fact that these engines are still high precision, literally handcrafted pieces of machinery. That's true. We're still building quality instead of quantity into our motor. The same as we did during the days when Colonel Hall was here. Were you here then? Yes, I were. And there's still quite a number of the old employees here that enjoyed working with Colonel Hall. Mr. Lloyd, getting down to this machine, we're looking at it, it looks like a laser, but I don't think I've ever seen one quite like it before. What's it doing? It is rough turning the center and two end main bearings, the gear diameter and the flywheel flange. You'll note that this lathe is driving the crank from the center. This is so that we can uh, accomplish turning these bearings at one time. And this is only one of a long line of lathes in this particular island. I noticed the lathes have the name Hall Scott, too. I wasn't aware that you made machine tools. Uh, we do not, but we had to purchase these lathes during the war, and we could not get the delivery date. One of our project engineers, Mr. Ralph Harrison, designed these lathes, and we built them here in our own plant. Now, what's this particular lathe doing, uh, Mr. Lloyd? This lathe is turning the number one and six crank tips. Another dual operation. That's correct. And down, on down the aisle further, and on the left-hand side, still another great lathe turns very slowly and ponderously. Uh, what's that one doing? This one is turning the other four main bearings. And this is a quadruple operation, then? That's correct. Now, this is the first roughing operation. How close do you take them on these lathes? Within one-eighth of an inch on the OD. And the rest of the material is for your cleanup for absolute accuracy. That's correct. Rough grinding and finish grinding. Now, right facing the end of this aisle, Mr. Lloyd, I noticed a, a sort of a tent-like structure, a green tent-like structure. On the canopy, it says Magnaflux. What is that? That's true. That's a machine for, for inspecting the cracks in our crankshaft. Here we have got a piece of steel, and we are now checking that for a crack. Now, how will it operate? First, he 
will magnetize this piece of steel, then he sprays an oxide fluid onto the crank, and this oxide, iron oxide, will gather around the edge of the crank, and with a black light, it makes it visible to the naked eye. Actually makes the crack in that piece of steel show up and glow. That's correct. It's an amazing device. I'm curious about something else, Mr. Lloyd. In turning these cranks on these huge blades, doesn't it set up an awful lot of stress and strain on the casting itself? That's correct. In the operations you have just seen, there are many strains and stresses set up. Oftentimes, our crankshaft will bend. This crankshaft has got to be straightened, bringing all the bearings back in plane with each other before we can continue with the operation. Is that what's happening here? That's what's happening there. Do you mean that machine actually bends that massive uh, steel crankshaft? That's correct. You'll notice the operator checks it with a dial indicator, gets the number of thousands that the crank is running out, then he knows from scale just about how many tons it takes to bend the crank. And so the crank comes out again perfectly straight and ready for further operation. That's correct. Now, uh, what's the next operation in the finishing of a hall cut crankshaft? Our next operation is rough grinding the main bearings and spacing them in relation to each other. Well, this device looks almost like a lathe, but you say it's a grinder. It's a grinding machine. Here we hold a fairly close tolerance on the main bearing for two locations. Is this a close precision operation also? Yes, it is. The, the gentleman that's operating the machine, do you suppose I can talk to him? Sure. Hi there. Yes. Who are you? Mark Kello is my name. Mark, how long have you been with Hall Scott? About 30 years. It's a long time to stay in one job. Yeah, it's been a good job. You must like what you're doing. I do. Good, thanks for talking to us a minute. Now this will bring it down. Will this uh, put a finish on the crankshaft itself, Mr. Lloyd? Yes, sir, it puts a fairly good finish. So we only leave about 15,000 on the diameter for a finished grind. And what happens to them from here on? There are many other operations to be performed on the crank yet. Drilling, milling, drilling the oil line, drilling the pin holes, and there's about 25 operations on a crankshaft from the time it starts to the front end of the line until it ends at ready for our inspection. All right, Mr. Lloyd, now we're off for another part of this same shop, and uh, while we make our journey, let's call on another of our success story cameras and on Harley Sater. We are looking at a whole Scott motor cylinder head. To reach its present stage, it's undergone a number of high-precision machining processes. Its various surfaces have been mechanically smoothed, its hemispherical combustion chambers, an early Hall Scott innovation, but recently heralded as something brand new, have been born. The action we're witnessing now is the grinding of the seats of the overhead valves. Now let's have a look at the Hall Scott cylinder block, to which the cylinder heads will later be assembled. This is the first rough boring of the cylinder walls, a process that is repeated in progressively finer action until the cylinder walls are smooth enough to receive the pistons. This ingenious boring machine with its six sticks or mechanical boring plungers bores all six cylinders simultaneously. But now Bob Day and Mr. Lloyd have reached this area to continue tonight's success story of Paul Scott Motors. Mr. Lloyd, all I can say is this looks like something you might dream about on the night before a dentist appointment. It might be similar, but a little bit different. Here we are drilling the oil, the water passage holes, where the water passed from the cylinder block to the cylinder head. How many holes are drilled there at one time? We're drilling 24 here at one time. Now this next machine looks like essentially the same machine, but with a good deal larger bit in it. It is. Here we are drilling the cylinder hold down stud bolt hole. The stud passes up through the cylinder block, through the head, and clamp the cylinder block and cylinder head tightly together. And what's happening here? Here we are chamfering the cylinder bore. Looks like you're putting a slight bevel on the inside edge That's there. That's true, we are. And at the next machine? We're doing, here we are counterboring the outside of the skirt. This is for clearance. Huh? And at this machine, do these blocks just pass down this whole line of machines? That's correct. Here we are reaming the cylinder bore, cutting down or leaving a minimum amount of stock for the honing. This is almost a finished operation then. That's correct. Now here's a busy machine and a very busy man with it. What's he doing? He is rough honing the cylinder bore. 
Now, when you say honing, well, I know what it means to hone a razor. You put a very smooth surface on it. Is that what you're doing here? Well, not exactly that, but here we are giving the cylinder bore a finish that will form many little minute, minute oil pockets in the cylinder wall, which will assist the piston rings to seat themselves to a tight seal. Now, is this actually the finish operation on the cylinder wall? That's true. And when it's finished, it'll be mirror smooth and ready to go. That's correct. I see. Thank you again, Mr. Lloyd. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lloyd and I are heading for the piston line here at Hall Scott. And while we get to that area, let's again call on another of our success story cameras and Hartley Taylor to carry on the story for us. The piston in any type of engine is the heart. And the mechanical heartbeat is actuated by the fuel, which to an engine is the blood. Paul Scott pistons are things of shining beauty, machined to infinitesimal tolerances. It is the downward stroke of these pistons within the cylinders we've just seen that turn the great motor crankshaft and ultimately propel the vehicle. The pistons are assembled to connecting rods, literally the connecting links or rods, which are fastened to the bearing surfaces we watched being machined earlier in our story. These rods, too, before their assembly to the pistons, undergo a number of exact and precise machine processes that take them from their rough forgings to the final assembled unit. But for the story of how the Hall Scott motor pistons are machined, we return to Bob Day and Mr. Lloyd. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a rough casting for a Hall Scott piston. We're going to follow it down this piston line and see how it becomes a finished piston. Actually, Mr. Lloyd, how long does it take a piston to pass through this line? About uh, 15 minutes. Well, we're going to try to do it in two minutes, so you can see we're going to have to hurry. So if you'll explain the operations as they take place. What's happening here? Here we are counterboring and facing the bottom of the skirt for two locations. I see, and across the aisle there seems to be something else happening to uh, a piston. We are rough boring the wrist pin hole. All right, let's move along to the next operation and see what happens there. And now another fascinating machine and another piston in the process of being finished. What's happening here, Mr. Lloyd? Uh, here we are centering the piston head. And across the aisle, something else again. Uh, here we are turning the piston ring groove parallel with the bottom of the skirt. Mm -hmm. All of these very close precision operations, I suppose. That's correct. Now here's a battery of drills. What's happening here? We're drilling the bleeder hole. So What's the bleeder hole? The scraper ring will scrape the excess oil off of the cylinder wall and they bleed down through these holes back into the crankcase. Now here's the man who seems to be weighing pistons. It is. We have to balance these pistons to a tolerance of plus or minus one sixteenth of an ounce. Is such care as that actually necessary, Mr. Lloyd? Yes, for vibration points. I see, and one more machine that we're going to see in this story of how these pistons become finished products, and here it is. What's happening here, Mr. Lloyd? Here we are cam grinding the OD of the piston, uh, putting a finish on the piston that will assure us a long life. And this, I take it, is the finished piston itself? That's correct. And as I said, we've uh, accomplished a 15-minute operation and some very fascinating machinery in just two minutes' time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there are a great many more very interesting places for us to visit during this fascinating success story of Paul Scott tonight. And while Mr. Lloyd and I move to the place where we'll make our next appearance, let's call once again on another of our success story cameras to bring us the picture and Hartley Tater to tell us the story. You are viewing Success Story, an on-the-spot live telecast from selected locations in the San Francisco Bay Area, brought to you each week as a public service by Richfield. Tonight's Success Story is coming to you from the Hall Scott Motor Division of the ACF Brill Motors Company in Berkeley, California. Behind every story of mechanical production genius, there is an equally impressive story of intelligent management. It is for the details of that side of tonight's success story that we now return to our reporter, Bob Day, and our distinguished guest for the evening, Mr. J.D. Town, Vice President of ACF Brill Motors Company, 
and general manager of Hall Scott Motors Division of Brill Motors Company. Mr. Town, we know that Hall Scott Motors is uh, local, San Francisco Bay Area success story, but I think we'd like to hear a little bit more about the history and background of this company. Well, Hall Scott was organized in 1910 by Colonel E.J. Hall and Mr. B.C. Scott as the Hall Scott Motor Car Company, not for building automobiles, but rather for building railway cars. <coughs> it soon developed, however, into a uh, business of producing uh, engines for every purpose that a heavy-duty engine is required for trucks, for buses, for marine use, for stationary engines, and even in the early days for airplane engines. One of the earliest uh, developments of Hall Scott was to build the, the motor that actually powered the first airmail flight in the United States. We also built, <coughs> back in the early days, uh, a uh, <coughs> V-12 engine which uh, powered many of the craft in the uh, recent war. Uh, the Paul Scott uh, built the tank retriever engines, which uh, did much in the last war. You know, it's hard to understand how any one device can be so much superior to other devices in its field. What features of the Hall Scott engine do you think bring on the superiority, Mr. Town? There are many features in the Hall Scott engine. <coughs> the much publicized <coughs> hemispherical combustion chamber, overhead valves and cams, large crankshafts, large bearing surfaces, which all contribute to quality. But more important than that is uh, actually the personnel in our plant, not only the supervision, but the men at the plant, at the machines and the benches who have been with Hall Scott for years and years, 20, 25, 30 years. They're the men who have really built the Hall Scott reputation for quality. Sort of a hidden ingredient. Absolutely. Now, how about the future, Mr. Town? We hear a lot about the changing picture in the motor world. Will, will Hall Scott be involved in the development of gas turbine and such things as that? Paul Scott is currently developing the gas turbine, also getting into many other uh, new features. But the point that Hall Scott has developed and has uh, been in use for a long, long time is the use of butane fuel, uh, LPG, a liquid petroleum gas. This is a very economical gas and gives us a very clean, uh, long-life engine that requires very, very little maintenance. I see. Thank you very much, Mr. Town. You know, I think our success story here at Hall Scott will be a very illuminating and interesting feature for all of our viewers, partially because of the very engrossing mechanical processes and partially because I'm sure that a percentage of the people had no idea that such a celebrated and historic company was operating right here in Berkeley, California. Thank you very much, sir, for a most interesting interview. Thank you. It's been a Gears are among the world's most precise and exact mechanical devices. Their mathematical tolerances between the teeth must be so close that in the constant, often tortuous strain placed upon them, each of the surfaces will mesh smoothly with a minimum of friction. In a sense, gears are the watchmaking of the machinist's trade. And it's a commentary on the human skills involved at this great Paul Scott Motors division that many of the workers involved here in gear cutting are instantly able to judge whether gears have been properly or improperly machined simply by their sound as they mesh. It is for the story of Hall Scott gears and most particularly a unique gear grinding machine that we now pick up our success story reporter Bob Day and Mr. Z.P. Lloyd, General Superintendent, once again. Ladies and gentlemen, here undoubtedly is the most fascinating, most complex mechanical device we've ever shown on Success Story. Frankly, I, it's beyond me, and I hope Mr. Lloyd will tell us what it is and what it does. Bob, this is a straight tooth bevel gear grinder, the only one in the United States. This machine here was made in Switzerland. Well, now, it's a very fascinating thing to look at still, but I've seen it moving, and I wish our viewers could do the same. They may. Now the operator is starting the machine, which is a fairly involved procedure in itself for such a complicated machine involving colored lights and switches and something that looks like the control panel of a spaceship. And finally, the gear grinder is going, and I wonder if Mr. Lloyd now will tell us exactly what it's doing. The grinder now is grinding the involute form of the tooth. 
So that means the actual curved shape of the that's, tooth That's itself? correct. It is grinding the flank of the tooth uh, to a correct involute form. Well, now, what is so remarkable about this particular machine? Well, they, we all know that the working surface of a grinding wheel is subject to wear. However, it does not affect the wear of this wheel because we have a compensating apparatus that will set the wheel in as it wears. Now, here in the back is uh, another type of machinery. What does this do? This is the index plate. This will index the gear from tooth to tooth as this table travels around. When does that happen? Is it happening all the time? No, right at the end. You will notice that, it did it just then. That's yes, correct. it did. Fine, and now around here on the other side, a very fascinating feature, too, that you might call uh, an electronic technician's nightmare. I'm not quite sure what it is, and I know I couldn't explain it, but maybe Mr. Lloyd will. This machine is automatic and is controlled by this mechanical brain here with all of its electronic tubes, uh, relays, switches, and so forth. Well, I hope they never call on me if something goes wrong with it. I have to see the complications in there. Well, if you want to know any more about this, I'll have to send for our plant engineer, Mr. Lou Goliath. <laughs> and over here, I notice this uh, device here bears the same name as the grinding machine we just saw. What is this? That's true. This is a uh, gear checker made by the MOG people in Switzerland. If you will notice that all the settings and readings are taken with an optical device, you will notice that we have a finger traveling along the flank of the tooth and recording the involute form here, or the error that is in the involute form, and also the micro ink finish. Mr. Lloyd, I'm a little bit curious, and I wonder if you'd mind if I ask this mug gear grinder, what would a machine like that cost? Uh, $55,000. And you say there's only one in this country? That's true. This is one of three that has been made up to this day. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as exacting and complicated as these machines are, these are only a part of the constant testing which every fabrication here at Hall Scott Motors must undergo before it's ready for final assembly. And speaking of final assembly, that's where one of our success story cameras is taking us now, as Hartley Sater leads us into the details of that department. At the outset of tonight's success story, we watched the lathes that machine the Hall Scott motor crankshaft bearing surfaces. What we're viewing now is a complex device to simultaneously bore the seven main engine bearings on which those crankshaft bearing surfaces will turn. Built by Hall Scott from another design originated by Ralph Harrison, project engineer, this is the ultimate in advanced efficiency. Now our camera is leading us to the final motor assembly area, where we return to our reporter, Bob Day, and Mr. Lloyd. Well, Mr. Lloyd, I suspect that here we're actually going to see the finishing touches on a Hall Scott engine. That's true. Here you will find our operator tightening the main bearing nuts, bringing them up to the correct tightness. That's a strange looking wrench he's using. That is a torque wrench. This assures him that all of them is exactly the proper tightness. Uh -huh. Uh, how close is this engine to being completed? It is about one-third being completed now. And the one next to it, what's happening to this one? The flywheel housing has just been installed. The operator is checking the flywheel housing board to be sure it is concentric with the crank shaft. Mm -hmm. This is very essential. Every operation with very close precision. That's correct. Now, here's one that begins to look like it's almost done. This one uh, is sitting, well, you might say right side up. Oh, actually, it's on its side, isn't it? Uh, yes, that's, that's right. Here, we are tightening the cylinder hold-down stud nuts. You notice he is using a torque wrench. This assures him that all the nuts are pulled up to the correct tightness. And I suspect that this one on the end of the line here is one that's complete <coughs> and ready to go. Is that correct, Mr. Lloyd? That's correct. Here is one of our 504 model horizontal type motors. This motor is of a horizontal type and is assembled into the bus it, under the floor. This is for bus application mainly then, this, this flat That's type of motor. Does it actually operate laying on its side like That's this? That's correct. It is not unusual for these motors to come back into our service department 
that has run four and five hundred thousand miles before they have a major overhaul. Thank you very much, Mr. Lloyd. Yes, this engine is finished, but mechanical life hasn't yet been breathed into it. And see how that's accomplished? Let's let another of our success story cameras switch us to the motor testing department, where Hartley Sater will take up the story until we arrive. And here, for the first time, the mechanical life that Bob Day just mentioned does begin to throb through the heart and steel arteries of the great Hall Scott Motors. Actually, at the beginning of the tests, the motors do not turn under their own power, but are turned over by a separate power unit so that the moving parts will receive their initial breaking in without heat and the resulting heightened friction. Then, after a sufficient period, when all parts have been checked for exact mechanical operating smoothness, fuel is released to the cylinders and the great motor roars into life. Now we return to Bob Day and Mr. Lloyd for details of the motor tests. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen. You can hear its defiant roar of power. The exhaust manifold, as I see it from here, is cherry red. And I'm going to ask Mr. Lloyd to explain to us exactly what will happen to this engine on the test bed. Well, here it is, starting on its jewels and pests. First, the operator will put a 50 horsepower load onto the motor and throttle it to 1,000 RPM. The motor will run for two hours under this load. At the end of this period, he will increase the horsepower to 100 and throttle the motor to 1,200 RPM. Then the motor will run one hour at this, under this load. Then, at the end of this period, he will increase the horsepower to 150 horsepower and throttle it to 1,800. The motor will run another hour. Then, at the end of the four-hour period, the inspector will ask him to open the throttle wide open and put a load on the motor, which will pull it down to 2,400 RPM. This is the full horsepower of the motor. And so by all these tests, we know that this Hall Scott motor will perform well and faithfully for its entire service life. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen, a thing of mechanical beauty, truly. Running, ready to serve you, ready to serve me, and serve all of America in the jobs that it does. This has been a thrilling story tonight, as well as being a fine success story. It may be the finest example we'll ever see of true pride and craftsmanship, of a complete harmony of operation between skilled labor and intelligent management. Not at all surprising to the people here at the Hall Scott Division of the ACF Grill Motor Company exhibit a great deal of pride in Hall Scott's plant and the products which it turns out, such as this motor before us now. It's another fine example of American free enterprise operating at its best, which is, of course, just another way of saying our own national success story. Success Story, an on-the-spot live telecast from selected locations in the San Francisco Bay Area, is brought to you each week as a public service by Richfield, makers of Rich Lube HD motor oil and Richfield gasoline, and a complete line of years ahead petroleum products for every machine in every industry. Next week, Success Story takes you for a live on-the-spot visit to Colgate Palmolive Company plant in Berkeley. Until then, this is Hartley Sater saying good night from Richfield.